Hello, dear ones. I want to welcome you to the Center for Contemporary Mysticism in Philadelphia. My name is Joe Irwin, and it's a joy together with you to explore this wonderful, amazing journey that we're on. As you might have figured out by now, we had some meltdowns on a technological issue. So uh, as as you're able to get on and as people come on board, just bear with us. And of course, we always record. So, um, you know, everything will be recorded. And uh, if you miss any part of it, you'll be able to uh, get to that. But it's a real pleasure to welcome our guest for the day, Jeffrey Olson. As you know, he's a global best-selling author and speaker and activist in many ways and the survivor of a tragic accident which took the lives of his wife and youngest son and left him physically and emotionally broken in ways that few of us can imagine, I think. Yet somehow over time, Jeff came to find the strength and courage to begin to heal and physically and emotionally and to see a new life beyond the heartbreak and the devastation. And over the past decades, uh, from reading his books, I've seen that Jeff has integrated these experiences into the, his life that has become an inspiration to many. I think calling them and uh, calling us all to embrace the beauty around us and to choose joy in every situation we come to. So today, uh, it's a joy to have you with us, Jeff, and to tell your amazing story, not only of what happened in the past, but sort of the aftermath and how you see that looking looking into the future. And we also are learned we will, in a little bit later, be joined by uh, Jeff's oldest son, Spencer, which was a real nice treat, who not only survived the accident as a seven-year-old, but now is all of her own up and recently collaborated uh, with his dad on, on your most recent book, Where Are You? So welcome, Jeff. It is an honor to have you with us, and we're looking forward to a good time together today. Oh, I, I appreciate that, Joe and Patricia. Thank you both for having us and having me. And, uh, you know, the technology foupas are nothing new to me. <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> computers and technology doesn't, doesn't like me. This happens right. a lot, uh, even in the best of circumstances, and the IT professionals always say, <clears throat> That's uh, that's crazy, but uh, but anyway, it's a pleasure to be with you. We uh, we love the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. Spencer and I have actually spent time there. Great. Uh, years ago, as a uh, as a teenager, he was um, involved in something called the School of Rock, like the Jack. Oh yes, it actually is one. Yeah, and uh, Jack Black. We, uh, yeah, we played in Philadelphia, and he opened for the Dropkick Murphys. All right. <laughs> little school of rock band and it we have such fond beautiful memories of of philadelphia and all the history and the beautiful energy there well it's great to have you with us let me before we get rolling here just do a couple of more things of housekeeping uh you know most people know patricia by now uh, i just want to always give her a shout out she's our interviewer and also an author, a former pastor, and a spiritual teacher, and host of this great podcast called the We Awakening Podcast, and helps lead companion groups for people who are participating in the global awakening taking place. And lastly, i like to thank every one of you who are here, because you're a big part of, of what we do, and um, whether you're joining us live or later by video or social media, but if you're new to the center, be sure and visit our website. It's simply contemporarymysticism.org, where you'll find hundreds of resources, videos of past speakers, and groups in which you might participate. Remember, it's our goal to be a partner with you in your spiritual journey. So we'd like to know how we can help you and invite you to get involved, join, support, or do whatever you feel called to do to help us continue this wonderful work. Uh, remember also, the last thing before we get into our, our, our time together is we do have a Q&A at the end. And so if you have a question you think of, uh, jot it down. And as we get further along, we'll come back and open it up for a Q&A. And we like to bring folks on the screen and let you have a chance to dialogue with Jeff or, or Spencer or Patricia or whoever. <laughs> but just the main point is remember your question and uh, keep it for our Q&A, and we'll have a chance to let you click raise your hand and hopefully bring as many on as we have time. So now, without further ado, it's a real joy again to have you, Jeff, and, and a little bit later, Spencer. So we're so looking forward to it and appreciate your time and your wonderful spirit. So, Patricia and Jeff, I'll give it to you and uh, let you take it away, and I'll disappear for a little while and come back later at the Q&A. 
Thank you, Joe. Thank, Thank you, you so Joe. much. Thank you, Joe. And again, uh, just to reiterate Joe's thanks to you, Jeff, for being with us. Um, having finished reading your book, uh, Knowing, uh, I've really been looking forward to speaking with you about your experiences and also kind of delving more deeply into, you know, some of the, some of the lessons and reflections on that. So your life, uh, in a sense, ended and started at mile marker 80 and you talk about mile marker 80 and you are on you are on the road with your family your wife and your two sons going back home after an easter visit to your to your wife tamara's um, family her her parents and life was good life life was good right i mean it seems like as you describe it like your life was just fabulous you'd married this woman that you fell in love with as soon as you saw her (laughs) you had these two amazing sons and you were in a job you loved and here you are cruising back home and something happened and tell us about what happened at mile marker 80 wow yes and mile marker 80 has become a sacred place a mystical place for me, even though it's the site of what is both tragic and beautiful. It's important to point out it's been 26 years this month. At the end of this month, it will have been 26 years. And so I'm now able to speak openly and and, um, coherently. I, I couldn't speak of this for a decade, Patricia. It was very hard for me to talk about. It was painful. I was still processing all that had happened, and uh, now I'm able to speak openly. But on that day, which was actually the 31st of March, 1997, uh, we were heading back right after the Easter weekend. We'd been on an Easter break, and we had gone to visit my wife's family, her parents and uh, grandparents. And as we returned with the whole family in the car, um, it's, it's interesting because there was reports of crosswinds. There was reports of a red pickup truck that was driving erratically on the interstate. One of the most difficult things of the story is I believe I may have actually just nodded off at the wheel, just, just maybe dozed off, nodded that off. Instance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and in doing so, I swerved to the right. I overcorrected to the left. I lost control of the car and the car began to roll, not off the road, but down the concrete at high speeds of about 70 to 75 miles per hour. It was a horrific automobile accident. Uh, The accident report said the car probably rolled no no less than six or eight times. I blacked out for, for that part of it, but when the car came to a stop, I was completely conscious. In fact, the first thing I heard was my seven-year-old son, Spencer, who will be joining us here in a few minutes, but he's a child. He's seven years old. I heard him crying hysterically in the back seat. Now, as a father, it's like, I've got to get to my boy. I've got to get to my son. And that's when I realized that I could not move. Um, I was pinned either to the floorboard or the seat. I couldn't tell. There was the broken glass, the rancid smell of gasoline. I was unaware of my injuries. I was experiencing pain. I was fighting to keep conscious and I was struggling to breathe, but I was unaware of that. What had actually happened is both of my legs had been crushed and shattered. My left leg was eventually amputated above the knee. Uh, My back had been damaged. Two vertebrae had been cracked. My rib cage was damaged. My lungs were collapsing. My right arm had almost been completely torn off, and then the seatbelt had cut through and ruptured all my intestines. I was unaware of any of that. All I knew was my son's crying. I want to get to my son. And that's when I became aware and and knew at the scene of the accident uh, that no one else was crying. Um, Tamara, my wife, and Griffin, my youngest son, uh, were both killed instantly at the accident scene. And I, I knew that. I was aware of that. This, this was the darkest moment 
a man could ever be in, uh, at least for me. I, I, you know, gosh, I've got a hysterical child. I can't move. I'm losing consciousness. Half the family's gone. And I, and I was driving the car. I mean, the guilt, the regret. I, I kept thinking, can't I, can't I take back those three seconds? What just happened? And it was in that dark moment, um, and I don't share that to be graphic or morbid in any way, but it was the contrast. It was in that dark moment, and I attempted to communicate with Spencer, and he actually remembers this. I, I was able to speak and eke out. I said, it's going to be okay. And in my mind, I thought, that's a lie. It's not okay. How is this okay? And that's when everything went dark. And yet in that darkness, I felt light come. It's as if tangible light came and surrounded me. And and even when I say tangible, it's like the light comforted me. I, I was lifted, as it were. I felt as if I was lifting above the accident scene. Suddenly I could breathe. The, the pain was gone. And I was having the thought, how can I be okay? What's happening? How can I be okay? And then as I'm coming to terms with, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, my wife, who I knew was deceased at the scene, suddenly she's there in this light with me and she's alive and well and gorgeous and radiant, but she's emphatic um, that I can't stay. She kept saying, Jeff, you've got to go back. You've got to go back. You can't come. And we we literally had a conversation. We had the conversation that if I stayed with her, Spencer, who I knew, I knew he was going to be okay. But if I stayed with her, he would be orphaned. And we literally made a choice. We had a conversation and made a choice that I would come back that I would come back and that I would raise our son. And Griffin, my youngest, who I also knew had passed, he was no part of this experience. It was just me and my wife. And I learned how important choice is. I mean, there I was looking at the woman I loved more than life, but I knew I had this little boy in the back seat of the car and, and I made a choice. It's like, okay, I'm going to go back. Now, we have no idea how powerful our thoughts are. I mean, the intention. I didn't have to figure out, well, how do I go back? It's when I chose I'm going back. That's when I found myself moving about a very busy level one trauma center, a hospital. And I have no concept of time in this bubble of light, if you will. What what I later learned is that people arrived at the scene. Spencer, my seven-year-old, was pretty banged up, but he was able to, you know, walk away from the accident physically. He still had to go to the hospital, and he was held for a few days for observations. He had bruised up his ribs and broken his wrist. He was banged up pretty good, uh, but physically, he was okay. Emotionally, he thought he had lost the whole family. Uh, with my injuries, I had to be extricated from the car. I was airlifted or life flighted to the nearest level one trauma center. I didn't know any of that. All I knew is I had crashed the car. I had left my body, if you will. I had said the most profound goodbye I'll ever say. And here by choice, I find myself moving about the hospital, seeing the doctors and the patients and the nurses and even the families of the patients. It's like I had a 360 degree awareness of everything that was going on around me and everyone I encountered, everyone I encountered, I, I, I knew them. I was connected to them. They were me and I was them. I, I now refer to it as the oneness. I briefly, there was a nurse that passed by me and, and she seemed to be completely unaware of me. I mean, here I am in spirit moving about the hospital, but I'm so aware of her. I, I saw her and I knew in that moment, I felt as if it was my own experience, the, the physical, emotional, and sexual abuse she had experienced as a child. And, and yet in that, in that same instant, I, I, I saw her magnificence. It's like, look at her. 
Look at her here healing, serving, helping people, everyone I saw. And it didn't matter who they were or what they had done or what they hadn't done. I saw them in magnificence. I saw them in this divine way, and I felt I was seeing them as God sees them. I, I, there was so much love. There was so much connection. And then I finally came up to a body or a man on the gurney I didn't feel anything from, which I thought was strange having this connection going on. And I stepped closer only to realize, wow, that's that's me or or that's not me. I'm having this profound experience, but there's my body. There's my body. And uh, that was probably the first instance that I realized in reality, wow, I'm... I'm dead. I'm out of my body. There it is. And I'm here and I'm completely conscious and aware in a, in, in a super awareness. But there's the skin suit. And, and I realized I, I've got to get back in. And again, our thoughts are so powerful. I've got to get back in. And, and, and in making that choice, boom, then I'm back in the body. But back to all the pain, the grief, the guilt, the regret, the trauma. Um, it was very heavy to be back in the body, and uh, I, I was ventilated. They had a big tube down my throat doing the breathing for the lungs. My right arm was immobile because of the injuries. My legs were immobile because of the injuries, and they eventually tied down my left hand because I kept grabbing at all the medical equipment. And uh, the hospital was a long, uh, a long ordeal. I was there for nearly five months. I had 18 surgeries in total. Uh, I had horrible infections given the, you know, the, the severing of my intestines and all. I threw pulmonary emboli, uh, multiple, the, the blood clots that lodge in your lungs. It, it was an ordeal, but I learned so much. Um, I, I learned a whole new meaning of be still <laughs> because I had no choice. I was there in stillness, in grief, and yet having had this experience, but it was a long ordeal in the hospital. Thank you, Jeff, for, for, for taking us through that. And I mean, there's so, so many things that strike me about your story. And one thing that you mentioned just now, which you say in your book that the found, I think you call it the fundamental rule of the universe is choice. Yeah. Something yeah. Like that. And that you, and that you, you made this choice to come back to make sure that your son Spencer would not be orphaned and what that choice entailed then were these months and months and months and months of dealing with your physical and emotional injuries. And one of the things that strikes me as you tell this story and that this amazing experience of walking the halls of the hospital and seeing everyone in their magnificence and seeing that um, just being enveloped in that state of love and experiencing it and seeing the people in that way. And then you come back into your body and you and you have to deal with your own emotional pain. And I'm just aware, like, so I'm, we're here on this Zoom thing right now, right? And I see you and I see me. And it's almost like two ways of seeing. But when you came back in, you weren't seeing yourself through that divine lens of love and forgiveness, right? Because you yeah. were carrying the grief, the remorse, the emotional pain, in addition to the physical pain. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's and that's so poignant you bring that up. I think I had an experience at the end of my hospital stay. I call it a near death out of body experience, call it a mystical experience if you will. I mean, I had been taken from ICU, I had gone through surgical recovery. This was actually at the end of my hospital stay. I was just weeks away from coming home. I was in the rehabilitation wing of the hospital. And I should point out that at this point, I was off of all the heavy narcotics. The two most powerful experiences I had was at the scene of the accident before morphine or any narcotics had been administered. And then now at the end of my hospital stay, when I'm off of all of that, and I'm simply on some Tylenol for pain. And I, I mean, 
I had been through so much, but I knew I was going to make it. I mean, I was going to be going home. And uh, I had laid so long on my back, I had rubbed all the hair off the back of my head. The back of my head was bald. And, uh, and my family had been incredible in surrounding me and seeing to me. And in this rehabilitation wing, they had finally stabilized my abdominal, you know, rupture. And uh, I had had a colostomy bag. I was able to roll on my slide, on my side, which is how I naturally sleep. And so I'm laying on my side and I fall into a peaceful sleep. And, and while I'm sleeping, I have this huge awareness that, wow, I'm actually sleeping peacefully, comfortably. And had I even slept over those months, I'd been unconscious and certainly I had fallen asleep, but not like this. And yet in that peaceful state, that light came again, that light, that same light as the accident scene. And it surrounded me and comforted me. And I felt as if I was rising above the hospital bed again, this, this lift, this ascension, if you will. And, and, and yet this time the, the light dispensed it, 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 cleared like a fog lifting off a lake. And I was in the most beautiful, incredible place. I, I've heard people say things like heaven or the spirit world or the other side. And, and those are all relevant, but the only word that comes close to what I was experiencing is I was home. I was home. And there was this joy and this familiarity and, and I was whole. I, I, I looked down and both my legs were there and I began to run. And and I was having such an incredible physical experience. Like I could feel the energy of the ground beneath my feet. I could feel the intelligence in my calves and thighs. And I was running gleefully thinking, I'm home, I'm home, and I'm free of all the pain. And then the message came or the knowing came that I wasn't there to stay. And, and at that time, there was this corridor off to my left. And I knew intuitively I'm to go down that way. I'm to go down that corridor. And I began working my way down the corridor. And at the end of the corridor was a crib. Now, Griffin, my, my toddler son, was still sleeping in a crib. He was 14 months old at the time of the accident. And uh, I had grieved him so miserably. I had, I had been haunted by the fact that in the accident, his car seat broke up. And he was um, he was ejected from the car. And I don't often share that either, but that was the trauma within me. And when I saw this crib, I raced to it and I looked in the crib and there was my there was my little boy. And he was perfect. He was sleeping, but but he was he was he was alive. I I I I swept and picked him up and I held him and I could feel him solid against me. And I, I was marveling at this, like, okay, if I'm out of the body, why is everything so physical? But I could feel him. I could feel his rib cage expanding. I could feel his breath on my neck. And I I don't know if you've ever picked up a sleeping child, but the the heat and the weight of 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 him and it was so real and I I leaned over and I, I smelled his hair. Um, it was just something I had always done. I don't know if you've ever smelled the hair of a loved one, but this was my boy. This was my child. And I held him and I began to weep just thinking he's okay. And I'm holding him. And as I did that, I felt this intense, overwhelming, cosmic, powerful presence coming up behind me. And, uh, I was raised in a conservative Christian home, and my thought was, that's, that's God. That's God coming. It was so big, and, and I thought, I'm in so much trouble. Um, and my little boy's here because I crashed the car. You know, his life was cut short because I overcorrected or dozed off, and this presence is coming closer and closer, and I, I had the thought, I hope I can be forgiven. And uh, with that thought, <laughs> and this almost felt physical too. These divine arms just wrapped around and held me and my little boy. And, and that's when the, the lid just came off. There was this downpouring of, of information of truth and peace and love, like, like it was flowing into me. And the first thing communicated was there's nothing to forgive. Everything is in perfect order. And, and I was 
Here I am questioning the divine. How can that be? And then I experienced what they call a life review. I was shown my life and I'm in the arms of this beloved being and I'm I'm looking at my life and realizing, oh, wow, that was a mistake. I, I, I didn't mean to do that. And the divine that held me simply kept saying, what did you learn? What did you learn? And I was seeing this unconditional love in my own life. And I said, well, yeah, but that was wrong. And I knew it was wrong and I did it anyway. And the beloved being that held me, God is what I call it, said, that's your judgment of it, not ours. We love you. You are as beloved as the child you hold. And I, it was a very personal experience, but I knew that rippled out to everyone, to all of humanity. Every soul was that beloved, that cherished, that perfect, that divine. And you mentioned choice. This was the big choice. I was told I had a choice. In fact, what was communicated, and I believe the universe communicates with us and the language will understand. <laughs> the being that held me said, I want you to have your will. Now, given my upbringing, I'm like, but it's your will be done. That's, you know, I, 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 I've read that since a child. And the beautiful being that held me said, my will is your will. That's how much we love you. My will has always been that you have free will. You get to choose. And I was told I could choose to be mad and hate God for the rest of my life because this accident had been allowed to happen. Or I could be mad and hate myself and beat myself up in guilt because I was driving the car. But God said to me, you can give your son to me. You can hand him over. You can exercise your free will and trust and hand him over and it won't feel like he's been ripped away. And in all that peace and all that love and all that beauty, I I was able to kiss my little boy and... Um, I handed him over. And then then I woke up to the hospital bed and to the amputation and the colostomy bag. And I was quite a sight. I mean, my left leg was amputated. My right leg was in a brace holding it straight out because they were trying to repair the knee. This right arm was in a sling because they had repaired the shoulder and they were doing some interesting shock therapy, attempting to get the nerves to regenerate in the muscle. I, I All I could do was be assisted into an electric wheelchair and drive it with my one working left hand. Well, that's the state I returned home in. And I'll share this, and then I want to introduce my, my, my perfect friend and son and mentor and everything today. But I had worried about Spencer, my surviving son. How was he going to accept this? I was the rough and tumble dad, and now I was in a wheelchair and... I, immobile and literally couldn't even go to the bathroom myself with this colostomy bag. And this is how I was going to return home. And I worried, how will he accept this? And my brothers who are my heroes, I mean, they came to the hospital to get me. They would literally have to lift me into the wheelchair. They took me to my younger brother's house where Spencer had been staying with he and his wife. And as we arrived there, I saw Spencer looking out the window, watching, you know, as as his uncles, my brothers, lifted me out of the car and put me in the electric wheelchair. And they'd put a ramp up. And I began to navigate uh, toward the ramp, and Spencer came running out of the house. And he came running right toward me. And then he ran right past me. And I thought, it's just too much. He can't deal with me like this. And I continued toward the ramp and turned the chair, and I just looked to see where he had gone. And he had actually run across the street, and he was knocking on all the neighbors' doors, and he began to shout, come out, come out. My dad has made it home. Come see my dad. And I began to cry again. I cry a lot since my experience. And he eventually came and threw himself on my lap, which just about killed me because I had all the sutures still from the abdominal repair. and. You know, I told him, I'm going to try really hard to get well, but I'm going to be like this for a while. Are, are you going to be okay? I'm going to need your help. And we still laugh. Uh, he threw his arms around me and he said, Dad, if you were nothing but a puddle of blood, I would still love you. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the, the reason I share this, 
that was a huge epiphany. That was a mystical awakening because suddenly here I was in a wheelchair in this realm holding my surviving son. And it was no less divine than being in that other realm in the arms of God holding my child who passed. I mean, that the unconditional love of my oldest son was as powerful as that unconditional love of the creator and um, I'm, I'm going to bring him on. I'd love to introduce you to, to my oldest son, Spencer. Yeah, and he's Spencer. here with me. He's Hello, visiting everybody. today. Thanks, Spencer. So glad well, you could be with yeah. us. Um, and, you know, as I hear this story, for me, it's, it's a love story. Like, everything about this is a love story. Um, the love that, you know, you, you had for, for Tamara, for Griffin, the love that you have for each other. And that's the love that brought you back, Jeff, and kept you here. And I'm curious, I mean, so, so we've heard, you know, we've heard Jeff's experience, and he had all the all of these very profound awarenesses and experiences um, out of body and encountering, you know, the loved ones who were on the other side. And Spencer, you you know, you had to face this tremendous loss without the benefit of those kinds of experiences. And so can you share with us a little bit what that was like for you? And also to know that your dad, I mean, and Jeff, you said you hadn't spoken about this for like 10 years. So I don't know at what point you knew Spencer that your dad had been having these kinds of experiences but what was it like for you to be in this in this experience of loss of grief and your dad kind of coming at it from a different place because of these experiences that he'd had scoot on up son so they can well, uh, you know it was uh, very interesting because on the one hand I had my father's experience that I could lean into and uh believe um but on the other hand i hadn't experienced it myself and so um you know it was comforting for a time to hear his story uh but eventually i wanted to get my own understanding and i wanted to have my own experience and for a while it was kind of like trying to um fit a square shaped uh you know peg into a circle shaped hole and I, I kept trying as hard as I could to to have experiences like my dad's, um, you know, uh, wanting to speak with my mother, or just to just to have any kind of sign that uh, was tangible to me at the time. Um, this was probably when I was in my teens, um, and uh, you know, I, I just never really had an experience like that. But I did have experiences at the time that I were miraculous and then I kind of forgot about them and as years went by I, I you know I um, just discounted them um, one experience in particular that I'll share uh, when I was about 14 um, I was camping on a scout trip and uh, that night I had had a very profound dream and it was uh, a lot of it was chaotic and um, there was elements of judgment uh, of myself and of who I was and just uh, maybe a bit of not living up to expectations put on me um, by uh, the dominant religion that I was raised in. Um, but amongst all that judgment and fear and chaos, uh, what came clear through the dream, the message that, that came clear was um, my mom came to me and she told me that, you know, um, not even necessarily in words, but she communicated with me that uh, she was always there with me. She would always be with me and that no matter what, she loves me and um, just kind of to, to do my best and, and don't let the world get you down basically. <laughs> and uh, so I had that experience and to a lot of people that would be very profound, but I lived with that for about a weekend and then continued living life and forgot about it. And uh, as I got older and, and wanted these, you know, wanted to have something that I could hold on to, I had forgotten about that experience. And um, so, you know, where my dad gained his experience through uh, his near-death 
experience and and through very profound events, I kind of had to walk through life. Um, I'm kind of more of an analytical guy, so (laughs) I had to walk through life kind of gaining an understanding or um, being able to to maybe intellectually learn things or, uh, you know, essentially what it comes down to for me is kind of what I call the nowness of it, just being in the now. Um, because with, um, you know, I love hearing about these kind of, uh, experiences and it always, um, kind of enriches my soul, but what it comes down to for me is like, what about the right, you know, what about right now? Um, you know, uh, so what if there's an afterlife or what if there isn't like I'm here conscious right now. So what can I do to, um, bring heaven on earth, you know, what can I do to be a better person? Um, It all just boils down to right now. And so what I had to come to was just understanding that we're all born onto this planet. um, And then we go throughout life having different things happen to us and being raised in different environments and um, being born into bodies that may have, you know, we're all different. We're all human, but we're all different. Uh, We're all the same, but we're all different. Um, and what happens to us and, and what circumstances we're born into kind of shapes us who we are. And so in a sense, we're all the same. We are different, but yet we are all the same because if I were born into person X's body, I would probably have a proclivity to be just exactly the way they are. You know, the person on the street, um, you know, the person in jail, it's, it's not boy, you know, I'd never do anything like that to be where that person is. It is what would have to happen for me to be there. And uh, so just kind of looking at things a little more rationally, I've kind of had to walk through and and gain that understanding and, you know, maybe doing a few uh, seminars and just different things. Um, I kind of had to, to walk a different path that uh, understanding. But, uh, yeah, that's that's been my path. It's It's so wonderful to hear you describe that Spencer and I feel like the two of you complement one another in such beautiful ways in terms of you know the the approach to the the spiritual life the inner life whatever you want to call it Um, because sometimes you know people do have these very um, intense experiences that are life-changing and other times and obviously Spencer you had experiences throughout this that were intensely life-changing but in a different kind of a way and yet, and yet embodying it, like embodying that in this world, in this life, and like you're saying, Spencer, moment by moment, like in this very moment, here we are, all of us, here mm-hmm. together now. Yeah, and, I, think, I mean, I, I spent so many years trying to be in a moment that had existed. There was so many times where I would wake up in the morning and think, what if that was all a dream? What if I wake up right now? And my mom and my brother are downstairs, you know, uh, making breakfast and my brother's playing. And what if that was all just a dream? And, uh, you know, what life taught me is, you know, I, I can't ever get back to that moment. But I do have this moment right now. So yeah. I try to make the, the most. I love that. I'm going to I'm going to brag on Spence a little bit because he's taught me. I, I, I was mentioning Patricia and I were talking earlier and I said, I think he's an older, wiser soul. And he came to walk with me through this experience. Uh, when he was, gosh, early adulthood, maybe 18, 19 years old, he came to me and we, we for the first time, kind of vocalized. He said, look, Dad, I didn't get anything. You know, you speak of this out-of-body experience, this dream or vision or visitation being held by a divine person. You got to say goodbye to mom. You got to say goodbye to Griffin. I didn't get any of that. I, I you know, and he, he, he said, I, I, prayed i i beat my knuckles bloody on that door you call god and it never opened and he said and i don't want to put words in his mouth the way i recall is he said look either you're deceived in some crazy way either you're making it all up and i've never known you to be not honest he said or if there's a divine power something bigger it it doesn't care about me because i was a little boy begging just to fill my mom again. Now this, this broke my heart, you know, and uh, 
I still pray. It drove me to my knees. And I'm like, look, God, I'll give it all up. I'll give it all away. And I had an interesting experience that night. I don't profess to talk to God every day, but I got an answer. And that whisper came, that voice that speaks to your heart. It said, why are you judging your son? Why do you think your experience is better than his? Why do you think you should give yours away that he might have it? Don't you know he's having the perfect experience for the expansion of his soul? Mm -hmm. And you had the perfect experience for the expansion of yours, and they do not have to look alike. Your job, Dad, is to love him unconditionally. Don't put conditions on his experience. And it was it was a bit of an awakening for me. I, I've continued to have awakenings beyond the near-death experience. And yet I've watched Spencer, and as he's grown up, and he, he's done big brothers, big sisters. He's reached out. He was doing after-school music programs for young, you know, Young people, like 8, 10, 12 years old to come, and they would play rock and roll music on the stage, but that was their therapy. And and he said to me one time, and, and again, I, I don't want to sit and speak for Spencer, but this is my experience of my son. He said, you know, if that thing you call prayer and God didn't work for me, maybe I'll be that divine light. Maybe I can be God's hands. Maybe I can be God's love. Maybe I can show up for those kids who experience like I do the shut door. And he said, they can come to me. I'm a safe place that they can share or hide or, or, or grieve or question wow. everything. And it's been, it's been incredible. To be, to be that, to be that love. You, I'm just curious if you, I, I know Jeff, you have, conveyed this your your sense that everything that we experience is the universe supporting us in our own souls choices and desires i'm curious spencer if you see it similarly yeah yeah and um at the at the very bare minimum i'd say it's better to have the mental um you know, outlook of, you know, I'm being supported in in what I do than to think that everything's against you. Because if you have the mindset that everything is against you, most likely it's literally going to manifest that way. You're going to have more resistance put in your path if you tend to see it that way. And Mm -hmm. so whatever, you know, however objectively it is or isn't, I think it's always better to have that outlook because it, it can do almost no harm. Yeah, which sort of ties back to something your dad said about um, about the power of our thoughts, mm-hmm. which, which yeah. you hear early on, right? Yeah. yeah. So the two of you have co-authored a book um, recently. Can you can you talk to us about that? Where are you? Is the title, um, yeah. and can you share with us? So this is written mostly for for younger people, right? And what is what is this book about and and what what was it like for you two to collaborate on it and what it was, is we, yeah we thought we were doing a children's book and 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 we really had i mean some guys fish some guys golf some guys work on cars we wrote a book together and spencer was the catalyst of writing it um but when we discussed it he said you know i wish there was a book out there for those little people those those young ones who don't have the answers. Um, you know, when he was little, everyone would ask, how's your dad doing? Very few would say, how are you doing? And, and, and people would say to him, well, your mother's in a better place. And he wanted to say nonsense. The best place for my mom is here with me and my little brother. And, uh, as we collaborated Spencer, um, and I'll let him share. He said, I, I want to do something for those, that don't have the answers. I'll I'll let you speak to that. You know, when I was going through the experience, um, so many people tried to give me an answer, tried to say what they thought I wanted to hear. And um, what this book is, is me and my dad wanting to give something to those who have just lost a loved one, or maybe it's been years, uh, but they, they, nonetheless have lost someone and uh, I want to give them something that might 
kind of encourage them to to look within themselves. And I, I you know, don't want to give too much away about the book, but that's essentially the message is just to find um, those answers within ourselves and to look for those little things that we may discount as signs and symbols um, that, that our loved ones are still here and that they can always live within us. That that's they, beautiful. They do always live within us. You know, as we as we did the book, and I and I love that too because it's not a religious book. We we thought we were writing a children's book. We've found that it's been embraced by anybody who misses somebody. Yeah. As Spencer said, the reality that they're they're not that far away, and and even in a very tangible, logical. This is what I love about. I'm, I'm the ethereal one, and Spencer's the logical, analytical one, and we do we do uh, make a great combination that way, but. They live on through us, you know, and, and the way we live our lives honors their memory, whether you believe in anything or not. And uh, it's interesting as we embarked, I, Spencer did most of the writing. I worked on the illustrations and I thought, well, we've got to find a child. We've got to do something that follows your path. And Spencer said, no, 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 dad. This is not my story. This is humanity's story. I want you to put all ages and all races and all genders and all, you know, put, make it humanity's story, not our story. And anyway, it was a beautiful experience to do that with him. That's yeah, fabulous. That's yeah. Was, uh, just, just putting it out there for, for everyone and, and, and making it as general and yet individualistic as we could. Yeah. Yeah. Could we see a couple of the illustrations, Jeff? Let me, let me do this, and this this is fun. I mean, I'll I'll hold these up. Um, you know, that's a little girl blowing dandelion seeds. Uh, this this is one of my favorites, and this one is very personal. Um, you know, like I say, we wanted to represent everyone, but. Uh, we wanted to have elements, uh, maybe you know, uh, from our own lives as well in the book. Yeah, so this one's a little bit more personal, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, the four of us running through the fields, but you know, everything's soft and uh, impressionistic in the illustrations. And Spencer was a catalyst for that too. He's like, you know, when you're in grief or when you're in that mystical place one being beautiful and one being, you know, sorrowful. He said, everything's a little bit fuzzy. It's not like everything is perfectly sharp when you're processing and grieving. And that's what, that's what we attempted to capture. Anyway, it's not, it, we're not here to plug a book. We just, it, it's here to, to assist people. It's, it, it is available on Amazon if you'd like. And, and, you know, and this is something that we all as human beings face, you know, this is a universal experience loss um so it sounds like a great gift to bring to bring your unique experiences even if the book's not about you but the two of you have so much depth of wisdom based on on the experiences that you've had so thank you for bringing that gift forward uh, i want to make sure that our uh, participants here our attendees have a chance to ask uh, their questions so again i thank you both, Jeff and Spencer, both for being with us today. And um, I'm going to turn my video off and Joe will come back on and he will lead the Q&A time. And if uh, you have a question, if anybody has a question, you can click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen and Joe will bring you on as um, as a panelist. You'll be able to ask your question in person. If you'd rather not show your face and you want to do it a little bit more like in, as an introvert, you can type um, in the Q&A your question. So again, thank you both. And um, I'm going to just make myself invisible now. <laughs> and please ask questions. We, we, we would hate to sit here and look silly. Please ask questions. That's a great idea. And thank you, Patricia. And thank you so much, Jeffrey and, and, and Spencer, for that profound and personal an insightful sharing of your journey. I mean, uh, we talk at times about how nobody else can, you know, know what you've been through unless they walk in your shoes. And you definitely have some shoes that have been walked in that often uh, are hard for some of us to understand. But but there's so many gifts and such a beauty there that that we're grateful that you are 
are sharing that with us. So now, as Patricia said, we're going to open it up and uh, see if some folks have have some questions. Uh, you have to click a little button that says raise your hand. And when you do that, uh, we can call on you and bring you on the screen. So um, it looks like we have a a question from uh, Janet. So we'll ask Janet if she would come on the screen. And, and, and when you see the button, click on join as a panelist and uh, turn on your video and unmute. And then you'll be able to join us. So hi, Janet. Uh, Welcome, and you can share your uh, question with uh, Jeffrey and or Spencer. Well, thank you so much. Um, tears inevitably flowed listening to your experience. Um, and I think the the question that comes to me is, as you think about your before and your after, having had these deep, profound experiences um not in 25 words or less exactly but how how would you say it changed you most how is your how do you go through the world differently having had those experiences you know i'll i'll go first if that's okay then spencer can go and i I can do this in probably 25 words or less (laughs) my my belief which was just a belief, my my faith, if you will, was transformed into absolute trust, absolute trust. I let go of judgments, I let go of comparisons, and I realized that everything, everything comes from love, even if it's a challenge for me, that it comes from love. Yeah, and for me, I felt like that was kind of more of a question for you, Dad, but uh, I guess I'm discounting my uh, profound experiences again. <laughs> so uh, for me, you know, there was times where, like I said, I would forget what I had learned. Um, but I think that, I don't know, maybe that was part of growing up and, um, you know, or maybe those experiences. For me, it's been kind of an upkeep. You got to upkeep your experiences because... Um, sometimes it's not so easy for them to stay with you, but uh, if if you don't uh, keep up maintenance on them, then they can right. kind of uh, fade away. You know, Joe, Joe, since we're with the Center for Contemporary Mysticism, right. this is a big deal for me, too, is that, wow, there's mysticism in everything. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I've learned that the little things are the big things. You know, we all, right. like Spencer, he wanted his mother to appear in a full apparition and speak to him and... Um, usually I find the most powerful, spiritual, transformative, mystical experiences now in a sunset, yeah. <laughs> you know, in, in, in watching yeah. flowers grow, in, in watching my son grow up. It, it, I mean, it, the, the, the little things are forever for me the big things, the big things. That is so true. And in fact, um, our thinking was right along the same line. Each each year, we put out a little bookmark. It's just a thank you to our members and friends. You know, it has inspirational sayings. And the bookmark that we put out uh, this past fall was a quote from a Carmelite father that said uh, something like, people aren't a special kind of mystic. Uh, um, no, as I said, mystics are not a special kind of people. But every person is a special kind of mystic. Mm-hmm. So, uh, to me, that that that's exactly what you were summing up. And and the mysticism in in maybe your experience of life may uh, come out and demonstrate differently than in Spencer's or mine or Janet or anyone. But but it's there if we take time to just look and be aware. Yeah. And and. And I, I think that's the beauty of it. Well, thank you, thank you, Janet, for your uh, for your question. And uh, I think we've got thank maybe you. maybe another um, another one with a hand up here. Let's thank see. You. Yeah, Cliff. Uh, we'll ask Cliff to come on if he would, uh, and uh, click join as panelist and start your video. And we'll have a question from Cliff. <clears throat> And remember, you can put questions in the Q&A. Um, 
I often think two questions uh, kind of orient us in life, and it's just a matter of changing one letter. Uh, one question is, what if? And the other question is, what is? Mm-hmm. And it seems to me that for both of you, um, there were a lot of what ifs, and there certainly is a what is. Can you talk a little bit about how um, your orientation, uh, how you live that out in the what is in, in, in the present? Yeah, Cliff, that's a that's a beautiful question, and I'm I'm going to steal that. What if versus what is? Um, and, and again, that mysticism comes up for me. You know, the what if might be religious. What is could be mysticism. I I, I think about that. Um, gosh, the great spiritual teachers. I you know, if it's Buddha, you know, uh, contemplating a a a lotus flower, or if it's Jesus. You know, consider the lilies of the field and the birds, how they fly. I think that the great spiritual practices have been based in a mystical view of what is. What is and and how do I embrace that and deal with it? I, um, you know, I experienced this oneness. And I was looking recently at the word honest. Honest. (laughs) H-O-N-E-S-T. What's one? What being one with what is, to me, is the true form of honesty and purity. And um, rather than placing judgments and having expectations, if I can embrace what is in love and beauty and peace, and not ask why me, but ask what am I learning? How is my soul expanding, given this experience? Then that's what is. And for me, it uh, might be a bit more scientific, but uh, <laughs> when I hear what is versus what if, um, it brings me to uh, my mindfulness meditation practice that I do almost every day. Um, mm. And uh, in being mindful, that's literally what one does, is that you are mindful of what is. And uh, as you have thoughts or maybe you have sensations in your body that then you have judgments about or thoughts about, you just acknowledge kind of like watching things pass on a movie screen you you watch and you observe um, but you don't get bogged down or attached to those thoughts and um, for me you know it's not that you don't have goals or aspirations or if you're in circumstances that could use uh, much improvement you don't have any goals but uh, you're much better able to deal with improving and, and, and working forward and having progress in your life when you are able to, in the moment, uh, acknowledge things as they objectively are. And then from there, work to, to, to make them better, to, to maintain them, whatever you see fit. My goodness, those are two wonderful answers. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Cliff. Thank you, Cliff. We had a... a a, a question or two coming in on our Q and A. One of them um, wanted to ask uh, Spencer. Um, in the time you were going through your experiences, and sometimes, as you mentioned, you didn't have necessarily the uh, you know lights and sounds and <laughs> kind of the special effects in a way that your father did as you worked through them. This question was, did you feel that forgiveness was a part of your journey? Definitely. It definitely was. And, uh, you know, there was a time even where I wanted to, you know, and I I did. I I literally took a look at, um, you know, significant others and and like um, my parents. I, I looked at their life and looked at any judgments I had about them or things that I felt they had done wrong or that they had done to me. And, uh, you know, was about to, you know, uh, beat on a chair. But, um, you know, I realized in doing that, that my dad is, is, is imperfect, just as I am. And I could very easily be in his situation. And, and uh, there's been many times where I may have dozed off at the will and, and thank God I was lucky enough to, to just wake up and maybe swerve a little bit and, and, and be okay. But, uh, it was, um, you know, in, in realizing that uh, it could easily have been myself as well and that uh, things happen so quickly sometimes, there's there's just nothing mm-hmm. you can do to change where you right. are. In your life. And, yeah. um, 
you know, it, it doesn't serve to have judgment towards that person, but just realize um, that we're all imperfect and we're, we're, you know, most people are doing the best they can. Absolutely. Uh, no, another question came in from Joanne. Uh, this is a little different take. While many of us have not lost family members in the same way you have, many of us know know the grief and the struggle in having lost animals that have become very much a spiritual part of our life. And Joanne was sharing that uh, uh, she recently had a, a, a blue healer dog that she had had for 18 years that passed that was to her a sacred friend and a master. And uh, she still grieves about that. And uh, the, she was just wanting to know kind of how you overcome that, you know, if obviously your greatest uh, grief was dealing with, with human beings who were lost. But uh, I don't know if you've ever had animals or if how, I guess she's asking, you know, how you would see or compare and contrast any living being who comes a part of your life that you have to grieve with. Yes, so, I, I would love to answer that, actually, and, and I'll do it briefly, and then Spencer can chime in. I, I grew up on a farm. Okay. <laughs> we, we had blue healer dogs. They were herd dogs. <laughs> moved the, the cows, and, and, um, and love is love. Mm -hmm. You know, if you love an animal, uh, your grief may be no less as if you love a person. The other thing for me, too, and this is I'll share this briefly. I, I run in a lot of circles of near-death experiencers. And uh, I was listening to a woman speak and I got to talk to her afterwards and she had a near-death experience and she also grew up on a little farm. And she said in her near-death experience, her father who had passed appeared, but he came riding on his favorite horse with his favorite dog in tow. And for me, it's like, okay, those relationships are as important and eternal as our, our human relationships and I would love to believe that Bob, my blue healer, and Scrappy, my my dogs, might be running around up there waiting for us as well. Mm -hmm. So, Joanne, I'm I'm really sorry to hear that. Uh, I think many times uh, of I've lost a dog when I was a kid, but uh, my wife and I currently have three dogs, and I know uh, inevitably there will be a day where they will pass. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to share this picture. I don't know how well you can see it. But mm -hmm. that's my blue healer. Um, he's my wife and I's blue healer, uh, Australian Shepherd. And uh, your sharing of your experience makes me think of him. And he is just the best damn dog ever. You know, he <laughs> brings a smile to my face every time I see him looking like he does in that photo. Um, but with that, I think that kind of goes to the question previously asked about uh, was forgiveness part of my journey? And I mm -hmm. think in understanding that you um, gave him that that uh, you know that dose um, I, I don't know exactly what the circumstances are but usually when um, that occurs uh, your your pet is in uh, a lot of pain and is uh, if you were to weigh the options is is better off not suffering anymore and mm -hmm. so I would say that um, you know and also with my answer concerning my dad and, and his falling asleep at the will um, we, as humans, many, much of the time do the best we know how to do in that moment. And hindsight's always twenty twenty. But you you shouldn't um, beat yourself up over a choice that at the time that was the best thing you knew how to do. Um, because ultimately, with anything that gives us guilt, again, the kind of science answer here is, I think anything that gives us guilt has a utility to serve. Um, in teaching us maybe to act differently next time. But other mm -hmm. than that, it, it, it just uh, wears down on us and, and is counterproductive and is, you know, you, you, you got to let that go. I, 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 I thought he was going to show a picture of his dog, Sport, who is, he's got great dogs. Sport was hit by a car as a, as a puppy. And, uh, and please don't judge me for this. I, I said to Spencer, I said, wow, I, you know, it might be best that the dog was maimed and it was horrible. And I said, it might be best to put that dog down. And uh, he said, dad, we didn't put you down when, when you, <laughs> your injuries. 
and uh, sport his his hind leg was amputated clear at the hip, but he's alive and well, and he runs around on three legs. And so Spencer's got a one legged dad and a three legged dog, and uh, yeah, we we have a soft spot for animals in our family as well. I'm to find a picture, but I'm not sure I'll be able to find one here quickly. So, <laughs> well, you're you're you know, and I think uh, we all relate to that. Aside from the dog that we love, often we come to that point of of knowing that it is the most loving and humane situation when a, a dog's suffering and their time comes to have them put down. In fact, we're getting a little teary around our house here because we had a greatly Love chocolate lab, Tyson, and uh, so sweet. And uh, even when our grandkids were just infants, I mean, he would just curl up in the midst of them. And, and uh, he, w- he was a, a true saint. But at the time, you know, there came a time when he just, he was in more pain. He couldn't control his, his limbs and in more pain. And as hard as it was, it's just, it's the compassionate thing to do you know, to help them move on, uh, to be out of that pain. And, uh, you know, I, I, I often think of, uh, one of the greatest quotes for me about animals is, I believe it was Eckhart Tolle who said, animals are God's greatest teachers of unconditional love. Yes. And, uh, that's so true. And on a lighter note, often, uh, you see churches who put up little quotes on the sign, and there was a church near us a while back. We're driving by and looked at the sign, and it says, God help me to be the person my dog thinks I am. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but there, there, there are true things I think all of life can teach us. In fact, we're kind of focusing uh, this year in our center on the sacredness of all life. And in fact, there are things that we're just talking about and not just animals, even nature can teach us. You see, if we have that mindfulness that you spoke about, Spencer, we're not so busy, you know, and have our minds so absorbed with the business of the day that we're mindful of each and every moment around us. I had a, I had another good uh, question come in here on Q and a, and it's just ask um, in your times of doubt, how do you bring yourself back to the knowing that you received on the other side? I guess this is for you, Jeff, a little bit more. I'm going to jump in real quick yeah. and just and share what my answer to that question would be. Okay. And it's just by doing things like this, um, or, you know, doing anything that works for you, um, meditating, um, just uh, whatever kind of you find brings you back to that uh, solidarity that you have from uh, your faith or whatever you want to call it, just continually uh, maintaining it and, and doing things to maintain it. Yes. And then for, for me, gosh, in my darkest hours, um, I found if I did something for somebody else, <laughs> if mm-hmm. I just somehow got out of my, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and just, even if it was a simple thing, if I could do something for somebody else, in some profound way, it relieved my own grief. It relieved my own doubt. It relieved my mm-hmm. own pain. And uh, that, that, that's the simple answer to that. Well, I think it relates. Uh, Linda uh, put forth a question uh, that she said that her husband of 40 plus years died in November. And at times she, she asked, you know, where does she find the courage and strength to to choose joy? in the months, you know, after a loss like this, because, you know, they were together for so long. And um, I would think probably I could guess a little bit. The answer would be somewhat similar to what, what you've said. And it is after you have grieved, then you begin to focus outward. Look at, look at those around you that what you can do for others. Well, and here's the here's the honest answer from me. You don't get over it. Yeah. You will get used to it. Mm-hmm. Time will assist in healing. Boy, when, when you're in the grief, just get to the next breath. Just keep yeah. breathing. Right. And then right. the, the right. next breath might reach the next hour, might reach the next day. Mm-hmm. 
but realize it will get better. It yeah. will get better. And the tears that are so bitter will, will turn into more tears of gratitude and joy down the road. I mean, we, we only grieve because we love that. That's yeah. the bottom line. I've, I've come to the conclusion that grief may be the grandest manifestation of love we, we experience in this, in this human form. So be kind to yourself, grieve. Yes, it hurts. You're not meant to get over it. It's like carrying a stone in your pocket. It's, it's there, but you'll get used to the weight. You, it will get better. So keep breathing and hang in there. Yeah, Absolutely. And that. there's a saying, there's a saying that, that applies to that for me and, and Many difficult times we go through, and I think it was a quote by Winston Churchill, my father used to say, and he said, if you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my dad I mean, says, I, if you're going through hell, don't stop and build a house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a little cry, crass, but I think it, it means a lot because the fact you sometimes you do, do just have to keep moving. I want to bring uh, Patricia back on and see maybe if she'd come back on and join us for just a few minutes before our time runs out and see if uh, she might have some uh, questions or reflections uh, to share before we start wrapping it up. You're you're muted. Yeah. I'm muted. I saw that. Thank you. Yeah, just again to thank you both. Um, I You know, my heart feels very, very full. And as I said before, it does feel like you know, this is a love story on so many levels and just to come away with that. And, um, yeah, I guess the, the one final question that I would like to ask, uh, and I suppose this would be a question more for Jeff, although Spencer, you might have something, some take on this as well. If there were one moment, like one moment of awareness or experience or insight that you could directly transmit to people so that they actually experienced as their own experience what would that be i mean for me it's it's our connection to each other and to the divine when i experienced that oneness if i could if i could transmit that to anyone it's like wow to realize my own divinity and it took me so long to be able, that i am that I am, and so are you, and so are you, and so are you, and so are you. That oneness is is the healing, and that's what will change the world as we come into that consciousness. I'd probably say the same thing, just uh, that interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you both. That, that is so inspiring. And again, I want to thank you, Jeffrey and Spencer and Patricia, for this this amazing time together. As Patricia said, I think. Our hearts are full, just uh, kind of walking a little along this journey with you and, and, and feeling what you experienced and uh, sharing the love that you have shared and its profound effect on how it changes you and it changes us all. So thank you. Thank you again. It's been such an honor to have you with us and a, a real bonus, uh, Spencer, to have you with us. Uh, too bad we don't have time to go back and play a little music from the School of Rock that I heard you were uh, <laughs> per participant in. In fact, right near where we live, I think uh, there was a uh, outlet of the School of Rock. But it's it's been so great. Uh, so I always like to ask our guests, kind of uh, looking ahead, what's next for you, Jeffrey? Uh, any travel or projects or new books or what are you... Are you up to I've, I've become a recluse. We've moved to the mountains. I shut Wonderful. down social media. I am enjoying Wonderful. the liberation of privacy. Uh, what's next for us is we're going to have we're we're going to make brunch here in the mountains. That's All what's right. next for us. But we'll take each day <laughs> on one one step at a time. But but our gratitude. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having us. And yeah, it's been, been awesome. It's been awesome being with you guys. And like uh, the question that was asked earlier, how do you? Uh, get back to your profound experiences it's doing things like this so uh, thanks again for having us and, and letting me be a, a part of your your meeting uh, it's, it's it was fun. all our honor Spencer I'll tell you and and to think it started off with all these technical difficulties and maybe one of our best meetings yet so it the, the spirit's always there I think to pick us up so I do want to mention that you can learn more about Jeffrey's books and speaking engagements if he has any among the the cooking brunch 
and uh, projects at, at his website, which is uh, jeffreycolson.com. I realize you have to remember the C in there. And you can learn more about Patricia and her books and her We Awakening podcast, which is wonderful and things she's involved in, and patriciapierce.com, spell P-E-A. R-C-E, patriciapierce.com. And lastly, you can learn about the center and upcoming programs and videos and all sorts of things you can participate in at our website, which is simply contemporarymysticism.org. So thank you so much. Thank you again for, for being with us. And until we meet again, I'll say stay safe, be well, and remember, you are perfect just exactly as you are. Namaste. Thanks for having us. Be well, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.